My name is Yupari, and I'd like to welcome you into my studio today to guide you along the development involved in creating this portrait painting. And this painting has been completed with two layers of oil paint and a preliminary drawing. If you want to see the previous steps to this painting, I'm going to have part one of this video linked in the description below. Here we have our model Howard, and I'm going to keep an image of him to the top left corner of the screen so you can refer to it as the painting develops. Now last week the underpainting was created just using lead white and raw umber. So we did a preliminary drawing, we transferred it, and then we created the underpainting. And again, a link to that video will be given to you in the description box below. So what we're going to do is start off with our medium. So the medium is Neil McGilp, and I'm just rubbing it on the surface just to bring back some of the dark tones of the painting. I'm going to read off my palette to you. So I have lead white, raw umber, alizarin crimson, cadmium red, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow, sap green, ultramarine blue, and ivory black. And of course, if you want to know exactly what brands of oil paint that I'm using, that information is going to be typed up for you in the description box below. And so let's talk a little bit about uh, what I plan to do with this layer. So with this layer, I'm going to focus on the flesh tones and on the colors. So one important thing that I would like to mention when it comes to the uh, process of the painting is that we were focusing on shape, value, and then color and how they build onto each other. And so the transfer drawing that was created uh, solely focused on shape. That was the where do things fit stage. And then we transferred it and then worked on the underpainting. And that gave us an idea of the way that the light is turning around the form and the whole uh, value scheme of the picture. So now that we're switching to color, uh, we have the freedom to choose whatever color schemes that we want to use. And so we're starting off with a combination of cadmium red, cadmium yellow, lead white, a tad bit of uh, raw umber to cool down the mixtures and now we're adding a little bit of alizarin crimson into the mixture. We're trying to mix a nice uh, deep and rich flesh tone. So now a little bit of sap green into the mixture and some more lead white. And when we created the underpainting, we intentionally made some of the lights lighter than need be, such as the light on the forehead, as you can tell. And the reason for that was so that when we came back with color, when we wanted to when we're going to want to go warmer, we're going to be able to apply semi-transparent layers of oil paint. So that is when we want to go darker and warmer with our mixtures, we can use semi-transparent layers of oil paint and create a sort of stained glass-like effect with the layering of the oil paints, uh, thus providing a little bit more luminosity to the color. So let me explain what that means as I apply this little passage of flesh tone. So with the stained glass, you can imagine the sunlight behind the glass itself, the sunlight providing a strong light source, and then the color of the glass showing through, creating a nice luminous effect. And so the brightness of the underpainting is like the sunlight to the stained glass. So as we apply our colors onto this underpainting, we can apply semi-transparent layers of oil paint, um, also known as glazing, to the areas that are very light and have the light show through the back side of the uh, color. Now you can also create an effect like this using Alla Prima where you just paint directly with opaque layers of color and that's fine. But I believe that you might be able to have a little bit more freedom with your color and create more intensity 
if you have a tonal underpainting. So I'm painting in the planes as I see them on the model. So I'm trying to create a little area of focus on the forehead and the values are getting darker and darker as I go further to the left because the light source is uh, closer to the right of your screen. So the values to the right of your screen are getting lighter. And this is very much like the value arrangement that we had in the underpainting. Now the underpainting is an extremely useful stage in creating a painting because it isolated the problem of value and structure. So now we are free to make whatever color changes we want to make without having to worry about figuring out the value arrangement of things. Now this area is going to be a little bit lighter over here, so it's going to be a little bit more chromatic. So there's probably a little bit more of my cadmium red showing through in this mixture. So the planes that are facing the light, not only are they going to be lighter, but they're also going to contain a little bit more of the chroma and a little bit more of the local value and the local color. And I will say, if you're working from photo reference, which is perfectly fine, it's important to understand that photo reference can distort the way that, not only distort perspective, but they can also uh, create some kind of uh, distortion with color. So this photo reference uh, is a little bit warmer, I think, than uh, Howard's flesh tones are in that light situation. I did try to edit that photograph, uh, the color scheme of the photograph to try and match more like what the color was. And try and get the best photo references that you possibly can whenever you're trying to uh, do this kind of process from photo reference. But in any case, the flesh tones that I'm mixing are a little bit cooler than the flesh tones in the photo reference. Now as we work our way to the highlight, we're working in a kind of medium opacity uh, of the oil paint. So that, that is, we're not working too thick. We're very much uh, keeping with the fat over lean principle. So the fat over lean principle to oil painting is that within the layers of the painting, you want the first layer to not have so much oil. And as you build up your layers, you want to introduce more and more oil. And so the underpainting was uh, created with less oil than we're using with this overpainting. Now I am going a little more transparent in the areas that I want to become darker, such as this little area right here on the forehead. So areas that are getting darker and uh, warmer, I'm going a little bit more transparent. And the reason that I'm going more transparent is because I want to utilize the uh, brightness of the underpainting to show through. And I'm going a little bit more opaque in areas that I want to make lighter. And so that's how I'm kind of uh, modulating the opacity and transparency of each individual area. And we're going to be focusing on little zones. So if you notice, I've been sticking to the forehead for a good period of time now. Now you can see I'm adding in more planes and creating more of a dimensional type of, of an effect and adjusting the temperature uh, of the color as I go. And you're going to want to spend as much time on an area or a structure as you possibly can until it looks like the real thing or until it looks as close to nature as possible. And with each individual plane that I'm painting, notice this one's going to be a little bit darker in value. The local color does not actually change that much. Now in my previous paintings, I tried to uh, vary the hues a little bit more, but with this one, I'm trying to keep it as true to nature as possible. In nature, 
the flesh tones will not change in hue that much unless there's a lot of colored reflected light going on but in this case there's a single light source there's some reflected light that you can see in the shadows and we'll get to that but in general there is one dominant light source and so the hues on the flesh tones aren't really changing that much these mixtures are a little bit uh, kind of in the pinkish yellow ochre ish quality and another thing I should say if I don't like the hue of any one area I can simply wipe it off and go back to the underpainting now we're going to be focusing on the eye and so we're going to be using a combination of raw umber and cadmium red cadmium yellow mixed together to get us a kind of uh, deep rich flesh tone and then adding a little bit yellow a little bit of yellow ochre to it to lighten it up a tad bit we're going to be moving our way uh, to the lighter value still within this the local uh, flesh tone notice how uh, that value actually changed a little bit so I added a little bit more paint to make it darker thus painting it a little bit more opaque now these flesh tones will not change too much in terms of their relative hue uh, but what I am going to focus on is the value orientation of things notice this plane is a little bit darker because it's turning away from the light and it's actually the bottom plane of the upper eyelid and I know that a lot of folks like to get to this level of detail extremely early on and it's a tendency that a lot of us have and this is kind of like the icing on the cake really think about it like building a house you want to start off with the initial framework you want to know exactly where the house is going to fit otherwise you end up building your house in the middle of the road and that's going to cause you a lot of problems so you want to know exactly where your house is going to fit and then you want to have the structure of the house in the framework the wooden framework of the house so that's kind of like the underpainting and now that we had the framework of the house uh, that is the underpainting we're free to paint the walls and decorate them however we want without affecting the structure and integrity of the foundation of the house so quite literally we're painting right on top of the walls that we built for our house so we figured out where we wanted our house to be constructed and then we constructed the underlying structure of the house and now this is very much like painting the walls of the house you get to pick and choose whatever colors you want your bedroom to be your living room to be and if you don't like them you paint over them again but you never lose the integrity the structural integrity of the house that is very much the same mindset that we are applying to the development of the painting so as we work our way up the structure of this lower eyelid we are getting brighter and brighter but we're still maintaining the same arrangement of values that we created with the underpainting so the areas that are lighter such as this area right here are being glazed so this is a very semi-transparent application of color and a flesh tone no more complicated than you saw on the forehead very similar allowing the brightness of the underpainting to show through in areas where we want to get darker such as this little uh, accent it, we're going to be painting a little bit more opaque so there is more paint on the brush at this current stage right now and I'm going to put another accent over here remember an accent is an area where one form meets another form thus it is isolated from the light and therefore becomes darker 
And now this area right here, the uh, concavity of the eye socket, I'm actually going to glaze it because I want it to be a little bit darker just to increase the contrast. And I want to maintain the value arrangement that I had. So that now what you're seeing is a dry brush. So I glaze that area by applying a semi-transparent layer of oil paint and then switch to a dry brush and then molded it on. Now I'm going back to the more opaque paint and I'm building a larger and darker value that I didn't see in the underpainting. And so now I'm just going to soften that with the dry brush. So you can also continue to delineate the value arrangement of the painting in the color pass. Now I'm going to go in with a little bit of ultramarine blue mixed with the raw umber and the lead white to paint the, uh, I believe they're bluish, greenish eyes. It's kind of difficult to tell with the photo reference, but in any case, they are a little bit more on the bluish side. And so now we're going to move on to the nose. So with the nose, we're going to apply a very semi-transparent layer of oil paint. And this is going to be very much glazed on. I really, uh, I like the value arrangement that we created in the underpainting. I would like to maintain it. And so I'm going to keep it in that kind of value scheme. I just added a little bit more uh, orange to the mixture. And again, my orange is just cadmium red, cadmium yellow. So I added a tad bit more orange to that mixture. And I did add a little bit more paint. And so now with the dry brush, I'm going to just scumble it onto the surface, creating more of a glaze-like effect to get more warmth into the shadow and to bring the value down just a little bit. And now the, pretty much the same color with maybe a tad bit more raw umber. And we painted in the dark of the nostril. Here's the bottom plane of the wing of the nose. It's getting warmer and darker as it turns away from the light. And again, when you have an underpainting uh, that is a uh, grisaille completed, you are at the most freedom to spend all your time with color. This eliminates the difficulty involved in oil painting where you have to consider the shape, the value, and the color all at once. In an ala prima type of fashion, this makes it much more simple, much easier and digestible for the artist. And now with a more opaque layer of paint, we added in the accent of which the wing of the nose to the left of your screen intersects with the planes of the cheek or the plane of the cheek. And so that creates that dark accent. So that layer was, or that color was pretty much just raw umber, a touch of alizarin crimson and a tad bit of ivory black. So now we're working our way uh, from the shadows to the lighter tones of the nose. Pretty much with the same color, just kind of scumbled on uh, to create a uh, glaze-like effect for the dark light. So the dark light is going to be the first light that we introduce into the nose. Now the dark light is the half tone, just as the light turns into shadow. Remember, shadows are created by planes that are parallel to the light source. Highlights are areas that are perpendicular to the light source. As long as you keep that idea in mind, you should be able to gradate your values accordingly. And now we're glazing over the nose with a semi-transparent layer of oil paint, a combination of colors that is no more complicated than cadmium red, cadmium yellow, lead white, and some raw umber. And now we're going to go in and do a, and create a color shift uh, near the top of the nose, closer to the nasal bone. And so the color shift is created just by the application of uh, a glaze. And now with a little more paint, we're going to add the highlight onto the nose. 
And now with the cheeks, we're going to start off with the darker uh, values. And so we are using a semi-transparent layer of oil paint yet again. So we're using uh, a little bit a little bit more oil into this mixture and it's the color is no more complicated than raw umber and the colors that we used onto the nose and now as we work our way up notice we're still going to be glazing so glazing again it's like a stained glass effect it's like a stained glass effect where we let the lighter values of the underpainting show through thus allowing the richness of the color to be intensified. Remember, the brightness of the underpainting is analogous to the sunlight shining through the backside of a stained glass window. So that is the kind of effect we're going to use. Now, the value arrangement was already figured out in the underpainting. So now all we're doing is basically scumbling color. And the value adjusts itself accordingly. Now we are going to be painting or applying a glaze that is as true to the tone that we want. But in general, the underpainting is going to take care of the value arrangement for us. It's one of the great tools in uh, really getting a nicely studied area of color. So here in this area, for instance, it's a little bit more on the orangey side. It's a little bit more orange. So we applied more orange into that mixture and through a very light touch, we obtained the chroma and now we're spreading that tone closer to the top plane thus creating a lighter value yet maintaining the chroma of that area and now we're going to pinch it just a little bit closer to the pinkish side so we added a tiny bit more of the cadmium red and lead white into the mixture now if you're wondering why i'm using lead white i actually used it for the entire painting the underpainting and with this overpainting the lead white is a transparent white that allows you to use more of it without losing the intensity of your pigment it's a very useful tool to use especially when creating a portrait painting. So now we painted in a darker plane that was a little bit warmer and now with a little bit more of the orangey type mix we're going to glaze right onto the bottom of the nose. And again we have complete freedom with the color here. We can do whatever we want to the color because the value scheme is already figured out for us. And now let's just pinch it a little bit warmer down here. Why not? A little combination of cadmium red and a little bit of yellow ochre should do the trick. And now we're just going to uh, pretty much just uh, rub it onto the surface here. Very much just trying to add a little bit more chroma to the side plane of the cheek. And now moving on to the shadow side of the face, we're going to start off with the darker accents. So these accents are going to be the dark tones in which the uh, side plane of the face intersects with the uh, junction of the facial hair and as well as the hair to uh, the side of his face and so starting off with a fairly warm and dark color this is perhaps just a uh, raw umber with a little bit of my warmer colors not too much chroma there so we're just going to start off with those darks and then work our way up using a semi-transparent layer of oiled paint. We're going to spread the color all around the underpainting. We're going to push the shadow a tiny bit darker in value. So that means we're going to work more transparent uh, with the mixture. So as I apply the color onto the surface, I then apply a soft touch uh, with a dry brush later to sink this color in. Uh, notice here is the dry brush. It's just a cheap sable just to uh, mush it on top of the underpainting. 
And this is how you can create a kind of luminous shadow uh, by introducing a warm glaze. You can even uh, create a whole new shadow by glazing over if you'd like. But I'm trying to keep the value scheme of the picture. And uh, I'm going to put the uh, image in black and white for a few seconds here so you can see that I'm maintaining the value integrity. So now you're seeing the uh, painting in black and white, just using a black and white filter. And now we're back in color. So you can tell that we are applying the color, but we are still maintaining the original value orientation that we had established in the underpainting. Now there are some schools of thought that emphasize painting the color of the light and the color of the shadow at the same time at very early stages of the painting. And if you're trying to go after a more naturalistic or more realistic image, I find that this approach is much more simple because we don't have to focus on the drawing at all anymore. And we don't have to worry too much about the value either. If I wanted to throw this shadow color uh, more on the saturated side or more on the purplish side or the pinkish side or whatever color I wanted, I could have easily done that. But instead I went for this more uh, naturalistic, uh, earthy skin tone for the shadows. And so that's just a note to you that uh, in working the with this type of traditional approach, you can make the shadow color whatever you want uh, through your semi-transparent layers of oil paint and still maintain a, a deep and rich color. Uh, but with this color scheme, I chose not to push the chroma the way that the uh, photo reference has pushed it. I really don't think in nature that the skin tones would be that bright or that saturated. So that's why you're seeing uh, this type of flesh tone mixture. It's a little bit closer to what uh, perhaps an old master would have done in uh, the influence of natural light. So now with just a little touch, we're going to soften these edges together. And so we're going to move on now to the hair. And we're going to be using just a combination of raw umber and ivory black to begin with in a very... Uh, thinned out application of paint onto the hair mass. So we're going to start off with the darker region of the hair. So the local value of this area is a little bit darker. So we're going to throw in an accent right there. And the paint is not too thinned out to the point where it will drip onto the areas of the face. And I certainly don't want that. And so what we did was we just applied just a little bit of the uh, medium, the Neo McGilp, onto the brush. Uh, to apply uh, this mixture. And again, it's just raw umber and ivory black. And I'm letting some of the gray underneath show through. So some of the cool color is showing through. We're just going to soften the hairline with a uh, with the dry brush. And so you can see how it's starting to create an effect of the individual strands of hair through the brush strokes that we're letting show through and softening edges wherever we need to. The hairline in particular is usually a an edge that's not as sharp as say the um, outside shape of the face. And that is because it's usually less in focus. Imagine you're having a conversation with the model. Uh, what are you gonna focus on? You're gonna focus on their eyes or uh, the center of their eyes perhaps or even on their nose but you're not really going to be co in conversation with someone and looking at their hairline that wouldn't be the case would it so that's why we uh, are softening some of the edges around the hairline and pretty much on the planes of the hair too so now it's a little bit more ivory black we're starting to add just a little bit more contrast uh, to the side of the hair and we're going to apply just a little bit on the right corner as well. So we're going to be spending some time uh, with the planes of the hair and how to create uh, the illusion of the hair 
through uh, glazing techniques and of course opaque mixtures wherever we need to apply them um, but for right now we're still working rather uh, thin so what I did actually was add a little bit of ultramarine blue into the mixture and a tad bit of the lead white and so now we're working on a different plane of the hair and uh, we're going to add just a little bit more raw umber to the mixture just so that it doesn't get too blue so it's a little bit more raw umber to the mixture we should uh, take out the saturation and I'm actually going to subtract a little bit of the color that I just put into uh, this plane of the hair and so by subtracting it it also creates a glaze like effect onto this corner which I kind of like and so the way you can subtract colors uh, is you could just take a paper towel and completely subtract it or um, some type of cotton or a rag and subtract it if you'd like to completely take the paint off but I just took a little of it off with a dry brush and then I started to go back in uh, I just went back in with a more uh, opaque mixture because I was going a little bit lighter remember when you're going a little bit lighter and you're layering an oil painting you might want to paint uh, more opaque and so now a little bit more lead white into this mixture and we're having some uh, lighter planes right around here uh, because these areas of the hair are facing the light a little bit more and so hair is an area within the painting that you don't want to uh, completely disregard uh, so that's why i'm going to be showing you how I'm creating uh, these areas and I know that a lot of people struggle with uh, facial hair and with beards so this is how we're doing it we're constructing this entire side as one flat plane at first notice how it's just one simple flat plane that's turning away from the light and the color mixtures are not that complicated they're very earthy and they're very neutral like you would see in nature so now let's just throw this whole area a little bit darker and again the uh, darker values uh, utilize a more transparent mixture of oil paint that is uh, i'm using more of my medium with the thinner mixtures and in areas that i want to subtract and make lighter as you can tell right here i'm actually just using the uh, using a dry brush and just lifting off some of the paint or ever I want to lift it off it's a very laid-back way of uh, creating the texture of hair and at the same time you're showing the previous layer of oil paint you're letting it show through which is kind of a nice effect to have in a painting and now we have a darker accent right about here we can't forget about the darkest darks on the side of the hair so that is a plane that's furthest away from the light as the hair mass meets the mass of the facial hair and we have another little dark accent here and we're going to be exaggerating uh, the contrast between light and dark a little bit in the painting that is we're making the darks a little bit darker and the lights a little bit lighter and so here we have just a little more opaque mixture of uh, the lead white to try and get some of these cool tones and now we're going to go in with uh, some of the flesh tone actually and we're going to scumble it onto uh, this area of the painting and that's because there's less facial hair around this area and I can still see some of the flesh tone through so I'm actually going to glaze that on so we're glazing that area of flesh tone and then we're going to work over top of that with uh, the opaque mixtures here's a little accent for where the mouth is going to be uh, showing and there's only going to be a really a tiny bit now with lead white we're going to be softening that edge yet still maintaining uh, that flesh tone that we apply because there is going to be a little bit of flesh tone showing beneath the beard so we don't want to completely lose that but again it's not a terrible amount of flesh color that we're seeing in this area so now we're just softening that little transition just showing a tiny bit of the flesh tone and that's 
closer to what you would see in nature. So now we're working more opaque. And now we have a top plane of the beard. So this plane is facing the light even more than the areas around it. And you can see how with that little uh, smudge that we're doing with the dry brush, we're starting to knit the planes into one another, uh, thus creating a more naturalistic effect. And let's add just a little bit more flesh tone into this area. Why not? Basically just took whatever was on the palette and then added it onto this area. And of course, we're going to work over top of that uh, to create more of a layering type effect where you see some of the skin tone to show through. So now let's go ahead and switch and add a little bit more of a pinkish middle tone. So this is going to be a half tone uh, where you would be seeing just a glimpse of light. So we're going to dabble in just a little glimpse of light into the lower lip. And in nature, you wouldn't really be focusing that much on that area. So these edges are going to remain softer. Remember the areas of focus, you want to increase more contrast. You want to increase the contrast, uh, that is push the light and shadow differences, and increase your uh, the sharpness of your edges. Notice the edges around the eyes and the glasses are fairly sharp, but the edges surrounding it are getting softer and softer. So you really want to work on your edge variety if you're trying to obtain more of a naturalistic effect. So now it's a little bit more of the opaque mixture of lead white. We added a light plane onto the side of the hair. Again, sculpting it out and really trying to feel the three-dimensionality of the painting. So we actually added in just a tiny bit of yellow ochre to the mixture to show just a little more warmth into this plane, into this mass of hair, but not really that much. And the hair right about here is kind of going to have a little bit of an ala prima type effect. And uh, we're working in pretty much just opaque layers. Now you can see uh, just how soft and how gentle these areas are that are out of focus. And so the beard has very defined yet soft edges. Um, and now we're going to construct a little bottom plane. This bottom plane is being painted so that the top plane of the mustache is showing through, but not a terrible amount. And it's pretty much just ivory black that we're using right here. In nature, you wouldn't really see that much saturation. So we're just going ahead and using the ivory black just to put in these little uh, scumbles and these little effects of the hair. Now you can see we're painting individual little strands of hair. And that's really how you can work from general to specific. Now we're getting very specific and just adding little glimpses of hair here and there, individual strands of hair. You can spend all day trying to articulate these little strands of hair but what's most important is that the planes of the beard are showing to create the volume of the image at a distance but when the viewer gets closer you do want to add perhaps some little glimpses of the facial hair just to show that you added you had a little bit of a delicate touch uh, even for these small little details and this is how we create a naturalistic looking beard. And naturalistic meaning that it's closer to nature or closer to what the human eye would observe rather than the eye of a camera. A camera chooses to show every single bit of information that it can capture, uh, but the human eye is very selective. You really see things uh, selectively in nature, and that's just kind of the way that we see things. So. Uh, as these videos progress, and as my paintings progress, I've actually been trying to obtain uh, a closer likeness to nature, a closer type of painting that is reminiscent to what the human eye observes. And so each little strand that we're painting in here is very carefully selected, because this is what I see at a glance, not what the camera sees. The camera focuses on every little bit of information that it chooses. And now 
I'm not trying to be subjective. I'm trying to be as objective as possible and telling you that this is how I see it at a distance. And this is how I'm going to paint it to reflect the way that I see the image. Now we're going to be going into the neck and very simply starting off with the darkest accent. So this is the area where the side of the neck intersects with the beard and intersects with the collar. So here we're painting in a dark little accent. And so the collar we're actually going to leave in its underpainting stage. And I just wanted to leave it there so that maybe in the future, whenever anyone looks at this painting, they see that the uh, underpainting was painted with a grisaille, so very monochromatic underpainting. So that's why I'm going to choose to leave the collar B. And so now the shadow mixture is being uh, very much glazed on. So the mixture is not that complicated. A combination of my cadmium red, cadmium yellow, a little bit of the yellow ochre, and some of the lead white to bring it up. And so that's pretty much all I used for the shadow. And the dark light is going to be painted a little bit warmer. And then we're going to just dapple it into the shadow just a little bit to create kind of a rough painting uh, texture. You can see how that was created with very simple brush strokes. And now we're going to just apply a very thin glaze right over top of uh, the light plane of the neck. But you can already tell that these simple touches are creating the illusion and the effect of what the neck would actually look like in nature. And there you have it. That is the conclusion of this week's portrait painting demonstration. And as you can tell, I tried to push this painting closer to nature and closer to what it appears like to the human eye. And just for fun, I left two areas within the portrait that are still in the underpainting stage and those areas do not involve the collar and the tie that I mentioned before, nor do they in involve the uh, white of the shirt, because those are obviously left in the underpainting stage. But there are two areas within the painting that are left untouched. So let's see if you can find them, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.